Hey there, it's Jason with the Marketing Podcast Network. Real quick, I want to make sure you know that the world's leading B2B marketing expo is returning to the Los Angeles Convention Center on March 21st and 22nd. It's high time we got back together to learn, see the latest technologies and solutions, and network, right? Join thousands of marketing professionals just like you to learn from over 250 industry expert speakers, educational masterclasses, and over 300 exhibitors. And this year, your ticket also gets you into the Sales Innovation Expo and the Marketing and Advertising Expo. So it's like three conferences in one. It's March 21st and 22nd at the Los Angeles Convention Center. Go to b2bmarketingexpo.us to register. That's b2bmarketingexpo.us. The Marketing Podcast Network is a proud partner of the B2B Marketing Expo for 2023. We'll see you in LA. As a business-to-business marketer, your needs are unique. B2B buying cycles are long and your customers face incredibly complex decisions. Isn't it time you had a marketing platform built specifically for you? LinkedIn ads empower marketers with solutions for you and your customers. LinkedIn ads allow you to build the right relationships, drive results, and reach your customers in a respectful environment. On LinkedIn, you'll have direct access to and build relationships with decision makers. Of the 875 million users on the network, 180 million are senior level executives, 10 million are C-level executives. You will also be able to drive results with targeting and measurement tools built specifically for B2B. And they work. Audiences exposed to brand messages on LinkedIn are six times more likely to convert. LinkedIn ads also ranked number one for security, community, and ad experience as part of Business Insider's Digital Trust Study. Here at Sway Group, LinkedIn is a pivotal part of our day-to-day and is just absolutely vital for building relationships with clients and with our employees. Make B2B marketing everything it can be and get a $100 credit on your next campaign. Go to linkedin.com slash MPN to claim your credit. That's linkedin.com slash MPN. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome to the Art of Sway. This is a podcast that brings you inside the world of marketing through the lens of influence. I'm your host, Danielle Wiley. Each week, through candid conversations with industry insiders, we will uncover how influencer marketing is making an impact across all consumer buying habits and is changing the way we talk to each other. Let's dive in. It was a huge treat to catch up with my friend Bones for the podcast. As you will hear, he is just an incredibly fun and dynamic person, but he also does amazing work, and I am excited for our listeners to learn all about his impressive portfolio, including his most recent film, Produced for Patagonia. Enjoy! Josh Bones Murphy is a director and producer of film, commercials, and branded entertainment with over 20 years of experience in the industry. He co-produced the 2018 multi-award winning inspirational feature documentary, The Push, about the first spinal cord injured athlete to push himself to the South Pole and was a contributor to Alex Gibney's film, The Inventor, Out for Blood in Silicon Valley, about Elizabeth Holmes and the failure of biotech giant Theranos. More recently, he directed, produced, and co-wrote the multi-award-winning feature documentary film, Artificial, that was commissioned by Patagonia founder and owner, Yvonne Chinoard. It had over 3,000 local screenings worldwide before being released on Amazon Prime, iTunes, and YouTube, where it has earned over 4 million views. Murphy's most recent film for Patagonia, The Scale of Hope, released just one week after the bombshell news of Patagonia owner Chinoard giving the company away to focus on issues of climate and the environment. The film follows former Obama White House climate advisor Molly Kawahata as she prepares for a climb in the Alaska range while struggling with mental illness and working to create a new climate narrative framed around systemic change and hope. Additionally, he's co-directing a film about the global plastics epidemic, which recently began production and is slated for release in 2024. Prior to his career in film, Bones was trained as a natural resource scientist and fisheries biologist. Okay. Hi, Bones. Hi. Nice to see you. Hi. I'm so happy to have you on. I 
I feel like this was like the luckiest thing ever because I <laughs> texted you two weeks ago or so and I was like, hey, any chance you want to be on the podcast? And then not like three days later, Patagonia makes this enormous announcement. And I just feel very lucky that I, I had no foresight. I just wanted to have you on. But <laughs> no, well, you're right. And as we talk about that more, we nobody knew exactly what that announcement was going to be and certainly didn't know how relevant it would be to the film that we're going to talk about. So absolutely, kind of serendipitous, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So let's back up. I, I guess I should first explain how I know you. Well, I know you through your daughter. Our kids were in third grade. <laughs> <laughs> Which is most people these days, yes. Yeah, well, also, and also our dogs are best friends because they were back right. door, like they, your front yard was my backyard and they yeah. would visit each other every day through the back fence until your dog taught my dog how to get out. And then they went on escapades that's, together. That's exactly right, actually. There, we, uh, Jack is a, he is a, an escape artist. We think that people knew his powers. They might want to keep him locked up because he's teaching a lot of dogs how to escape. Yeah. <laughs> but so we met, we met back in Mill Valley when we were there and that's, our kids are seniors in high school now. So that was a while ago and yeah. good friends with you and your wife, Emily. And we just lucked into these awesome people and you have this amazing background and well, you also helped me to ski better, which is a whole other story. <laughs> Yeah, small yeah. benefit, added yeah. benefit. Friends, I always, I'm like, if you can take the yeah. chairlift with Bones after you've skied a run with him, like it's so good. Like he gives you all the tips, all the tips. But so tell us, that, like it would be great to hear a little bit about how you got into filmmaking and kind of what that trajectory was. And then we can talk about some of this exciting Patagonia stuff that you've been doing. Yeah, so it's it's kind of a funny long story that I'll make short. But when I was a kid, Jacques Cousteau was my idol I wanted to be either Jacques Cousteau or a professional hockey player because those are definitely similar, right? Totally. And I, I just, I loved fishing. I loved water. I loved the the world beneath the surface. And Cousteau took us there. And my dad tells this funny story that there was like one of the NHL playoff games. His friends came over to watch the game. And I was like, no, no, dad, Cousteau's on tonight. He's like, the game. He's, and I was like, no, it's Cousteau. We have to watch Cousteau. And he's like, you you guys mind? And they're like, no, no, no. So they turned off the hockey <laughs> game and we all watched Cousteau until it was over. And I think they went back and watched the hockey game. But I just remember always being enthralled with what the places he took us. And at the time, I thought of him as a scientist. And I went into science in my graduate and postgraduate degrees, specifically in fisheries biology. And only later did I realize after I'd gotten into film that Cousteau's legacy is really a filmmaker. He's a storyteller. That's the only reason we know of him. I mean, of course, an amazing explorer. He developed the scuba system, self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, as I used to kind of uh, rehearse as a kid because I wanted to know what scuba stood for. But really, the, the reason we know of Cousteau is because of his film. And so, of course, I came to that realization later. But I got into film as a professional skier. And I, and I use professional in, in air quotes in part because at the time you got paid very little to ski a lot. And, and that's, I had been competing and then began free skiing and filming and doing photo shoots and whatnot. And then realized, I want to tell this story. Knew nothing about filmmaking other than like, I've been shooting a bunch of videos as a, as a kayaker just for like mm -hmm. fun, silly stuff. And a friend of mine who was also a filmmaker taught me how to shoot film. And I bought a camera on eBay. It was a 16 millimeter Bolex, which you wind up and the spring allows you 15 seconds of shooting and you roll, shoot a roll of film, 50 foot roll, which is three and a half minutes. If you're shooting at regular speed, if you want it to be slow motion, take that and cut it in half, basically. So wow. you're you know, like a minute in a bit if you shoot it pretty fast. And yeah, I bought this camera on eBay. eBay was like two years old at the time. And I'm, I was sure I was going to get like fleeced and it worked. And the friend said, see this thing on the front? That's focused. You just don't worry about this, this number. If it's sunny outside, put it on like 16 or 22. And if it's cloudy, just put it on eight. I didn't even know what aperture really was. I mean, it's so funny that it worked that way, but then I was able to get in the right spot and knew what to look for, for, for what was aesthetically interesting and started all of a sudden making ski movies. And I made ski movies for six years and that's all I did. And then I went into reality TV for quite some time, which was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> my uh, college roommate went into, she was an editor on Dog the Bounty Hunter. Oh my God. 
and yeah. is now a midwife that it like sent her completely to like she was like what thing can I do that is as far away from this exactly. as possible? It's train wreck TV and sometimes need that outlet, right? I mean, sometimes heavy films, kind of the ones I take on with with environmental causes and purposes, they can kind of be overwhelming. And sometimes you just want to watch Dog the Bounty Hunter, I guess. <laughs> I did it because, of course, I was like, the only way I can get better as a storyteller is stay in the game. And if somebody's going to pay me to do this, I'll do it because it keeps me staying in the game. And then I realized I can't stay in this game anymore. So I started moving towards documentary film and narrative film and started to realize, wow, what I really need to do is get back to this kind of storytelling of, of humans intersecting with environment. And that's how I came to focus as I have the last six to eight years if not more of my 20 plus year career on that kind of story. And then that brought me to this kind of wonderful moment uh, years ago when Patagonia founder Yvonne Chouinard shooting a little retrospective on 1% for the Planet, which is their nonprofit that they started around 15 years ago now. And we were just shooting for four hours with he and Craig Matthews, who was the co-founder with Yvonne. And we were just shooting a little, a little piece with them. And over lunch, somebody happened to say, Yvonne, you know, what, what's your next film? And he said, oh, it's a film about the arrogance of man. And I still to this day chuckle remembering that because I was like, oh, where does this go? And he said, it's about the way we're unwilding salmon and trout through the use of hatcheries and fish farms. And like I nearly dropped my sandwich in my lap because that's what I had studied in graduate school. That's your thing. And I just explained that over lunch. And we were sitting on the back of the tailgate of a truck in Ennis, Montana. And at the end of the day, Yvonne came up and said, you know, do you have a card? I, I didn't. He said, well, just, just give me your number. I scribbled up my number on a piece of paper and an email. And he said, I'll call you. And I, that's quaint. It's not going to happen that way. And two days later, his producer from Patagonia Films did call, which began Artificial, which now released three plus years ago, which was the first time I got to work with Patagonia and made what became a very successful film about the future of wild. And then fast forward to two years ago now, they reached out to say, we have a story we'd like to tell about an interesting character. There's a couple characters in the running, but it became clear that there was one character that we kind of landed on. And it was this woman, Molly Kawahata, who was a climate advisor in the Obama White House and an aspiring alpinist or or mountain climber and a person who was kind of trying to re-engineer, if you will, in our minds, the way we should be talking about climate activism and how to get more people involved in it. And she felt like she had a really intimate way of doing so because she's very in touch with her mind daily because she is bipolar and understands how the mind works and thinks that if we look at neuroscience, science, we, we can, there's a lot to learn about how to motivate people to doing something as opposed to motivate them through what we think might be a good way to do it, which is through fear. And she thinks that we can be motivated through hope. And so that is The Scale of Hope, which is a film we just released. And then lo and behold, the release date got pushed back. It just released on Friday. So it's available now in Patagonia and on YouTube and be, I think rolling out on other platforms. But it was scheduled to release and they said, hold on, there's a big announcement. Nobody knows what it is, but we can't release the film now. Okay, great. And then the announcement happens to be Yvonne Chouinard, founder of Patagonia, saying that we are going to give away the company, put it into a trust, and that trust is going to focus on issues of climate and environment so that, in their words, we can continue to work towards saving our home planet. That's their mission to save our home planet, as told by Patagonia. So that landed, and then everything got nudged, and then... One week after that announcement, The Scale of Hope launched. So it's been a really kind of odd and exciting and and bewildering week, I would say. Yeah, it's just been amazing. We saw that announcement and we're like, what? (laughs) Supposedly, I didn't see the announcement, but supposedly everyone knew it was a big thing. It was the 50th anniversary of the founding of Patagonia. And so they had an event. They didn't know it was going to be announced. And Yvonne supposedly walked out on stage and said, just so you know, I'm not dying. (laughs) And then explained what they were going to do and explained how they just wanted to get it right. It was two years in the making. They made sure nobody knew about it and they wanted to get it right. But yeah, it took everybody by surprise. So I want to talk a little bit. I'm so fascinated by Patagonia's approach to influence and using art and storytelling to kind of woo people in this way. I mean, we work with brands all the time and we hire influencers and some of what they create is pretty remarkable. But I mean, this is on a whole other scale, no pun intended. And I know he had this idea for the Salmon movie for Artificial before he connected with you. But I mean, what are your thoughts on using full length documentary features to influence people and kind of help tell the story and and inspire people to make this change that needs to happen? 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting question because in reality, I think we are in the golden age of visual storytelling. You know, there was a big push in film way back, way, way back when film didn't have a lot of talking where it was kind of began to bring people into studios. And then there was times where the talkies came and people that didn't read could see films. and They didn't need to be able to read, to be told stories, but we've always been a storytelling animal. And we did that orally. Then we did it through writing and some people read more than others. And now we have this kind of democratization in some ways of storytelling because of streaming video. What we're doing right here is this, this ability now to create stories that don't require you to pay 15 bucks, five bucks, 10 bucks at the door and allow you to access new perspectives, in this case for free, which is how Patagonia does it. That was never the case. In fact, when we released Artificial, our representative who was helping sell the film said, okay, so what you want us to do is find the, the, you know, the highest bidder for the film if we were to sell it. And we were like, actually, no. And they were like, excuse me? We said, no, what we want to do is find that outlet that can help us get it to the most viewers. And they were like, right, but now getting back to the money. And Patagonia was like, no, 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 it's not about the money. And they were like, wait, hold on. Because in Hollywood, that's how things get done. Money buys influence. Money, money makes everything work. Patagonia short-circuited it saying, no, it's not about that. It's about sharing these stories with people. And we can only really do that through the medium of basically web viewing, right? I mean, certainly people can use YouTube in their own home theater now, Amazon Prime, iTunes, these self-distribution modes as well. But that's what Patagonia focuses on. I remember thinking, oh no, we can't show this film on YouTube. I've never watched a full-length film on YouTube. To this day, I still haven't. Yeah. I mean, and they were like, but we get metrics. We get to see who watches it. We get to understand where they're watching and how long they engaged. I was like, yeah, but you're only getting that for the people that watch it on YouTube. And they're right. This is a great and valuable way because when you sell it to Netflix, Netflix gives you zero, none, nothing. They don't tell you anything about anything. They just give you like the sales report. And so Patagonia wants to know how to reach viewers. That's what the goal is. So for them, the return on investment is really at some level, the return on impact. It's a different ROI, right? Mm -hmm. They're selling clothing so that they can use those proceeds to tell stories that enable them to reach this much larger goal. They're on the mission to save our home planet, right? That is what they want to do. And they actually, Yvonne has been quoted as saying, he thinks of them as more of a film company than a clothing company in many ways, because the clothing allows them to reach that goal and allows people to be outside in a way that they can have a a relationship with nature that they might not have had if they weren't outside. So the clothing actually helps kind of get them there. Some of the clothing, other ones is just like yoga pants. (laughs) It's it's not the case, But, but I think their whole mission has been to use story to inform their audience. One second, dogs. So I think when seen in that light, that their mission is to inform people, then it makes a lot more sense why a brand that sells clothing would actually embrace the style of storytelling like a full-length documentary. And what's interesting is Artificial was their second feature-length film. The first was Damnation. Great film. And then after that, they've been creating quite a few more. This film was envisioned as like a 35 to 45-minute short. And... When we started putting the film together, it began to have so much nuance and texture, for lack of a better word, that we didn't quite understand at the outset. It became clear that telling it any shorter than full length would not have done the story justice. And quite honestly, probably would not have engaged an audience the way it seems to have since it's you know released just last week. So the length now is just a product of what engages the audience. And I think Patagonia is looking for stories that some are short, some are long. And this one kind of took on a new form, than, a different form than originally envisioned because the character and the story became so interesting. Really. And then you said something on your Instagram the other day that I just found so interesting. So Patagonia does screenings of the films in their stores. And you were talking about just this new use of like taking a retail space and using it in this whole other way and how it's pretty cool. It's amazing. It's it's the idea that retail space can also be thought space. I had never seen this until we did the artificial tour. That was the first time. I know they had been doing other films because that was their second feature film and the first they'd ever distributed that way. I was just blown away that stores would just move away all of the, the merchandise 
and create a place where people could debate, learn, find inspiration, ask questions. I was like, oh, I mean, when we think about these spaces, we think you go in there and the conceit is you look at the product, you find it, you buy it, you check it out, you go home, right? And they had this whole other way of saying, no, this space is about furthering our values. And those values include debating really thorny topics sometimes, specifically for Patagonia, those environmental topics. But one of the most amazing shows we had with Artificial was in Soho in New York. I'm like, oh my God, we're going to show this film in New York. Nobody's going to care about it. It's New York City, right? That, whatever. Of course, New York City is like highly educated, literati. I mean, it blew my mind. There were two floors they were showing the, the film on. And on both floors, people were asking questions and engaging. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. In the middle, there was a floor that had a band and beer. And I was like, wow. And so once again, for the scale of hope coming post COVID, which really that changed everything that stopped. I mean, Patagonia was one of the first retail outlets to close during the pandemic and they're just coming back online. So going back into some of these spaces and realizing, oh, right, this can be done again. Retail space and thought space was really exciting to see faces again, which was crazy, not just mask faces, but actual faces in a live environment, engaging with the topics of the film and asking questions of Molly and myself. I was like, wow, this is what a purpose-driven company can do with a space that would be otherwise used for only one thing, which is commerce. And now it's for right. something much greater. So pivoting, I didn't even ask you if it's okay to talk about this so you can like <laughs> put the kibosh on it. Would love to talk to you a little bit about the Theranos work ah. that you did. Sure, totally. Yeah, okay. That's funny. Because <laughs> I, rem- I remember sitting having pizza with you guys and you're like, I'm doing this film for this woman and it's pretty crazy what she's doing. And of course it was Elizabeth. Holmes. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we've learned a lot since that night many yeah. years ago at Tony Tutos. <laughs> right. But it's kind of like the dichotomy, I think, is interesting to me that you can use storytelling for so much good. And then, I mean, obviously, the intent with what you were doing for Theranos was to tell a story about all this good that she was doing and changing the world and having this groundbreaking technology. But yeah, there's also some danger in storytelling because if the story is coming from the wrong person who's kind of malicious without anyone knowing you're like weaponizing. You're exactly right. It's, it's interesting because I was asked many years ago by a producer that I knew in San Francisco to assist a very famous photographer named Martin Scholler, who does some of the most kind of intriguing celebrity photography you've ever seen. He has the one style he uses that have two bars in each eye. So when you see a Martin Scholler photo, you look and say, oh, that guy. And he is himself an amazing visual storyteller. But this producer said, hey, this photographer is doing this. It was a, you know, a tech company, basically, in the Bay Area. As storytellers, we work with a lot of tech companies because they need to tell their stories to investors, to the consumers, in the brand, consumer to brand. So for me, it was just, oh, great. And I get to work with this really wonderful visual artist. And Martin and I collaborated to say, how do we bring his style to motion and how do we do that with both employees as well as you know the heads of the company and i remember i met elizabeth and it was in the old facebook building as i had been told i didn't know that hold on dog scratch and so we just had a meeting with with elizabeth and martin and i and we just talked about what they were doing and i was like on its face value it was pretty amazing. They had been totally silent for 10 years, hadn't told anybody about what they were doing. They were developing this technology and they were just about to begin to share the technology. And they were bringing in storytellers like Martin and myself to kind of help share that story. And part of that story was, of course, Elizabeth. And she did have a deep voice. I don't know if that was fake or not fake. To People have told me in testimony, which I haven't watched. I'd like to. But yeah. it's different, right? I don't know. Maybe the first day I met her, she had a black turtleneck. I don't remember. I don't think she did. Actually, I think that became that was something later. But it was like, wow, what she's trying to do is really interesting. The idea that blood tests are not... You can't elect to have a blood test. You have to go to a doctor and the doctor has to prescribe a blood test. And I was like, that's kind of interesting. Like, it's your blood. You can't even ask to have your blood tested. I kind of get what you're advocating for. And then the cost of the tests that they were talking about were so radically different. And so in my mind, having a science background... 
they were taking like nanotechnology and applying it to blood testing. And I was like, now that is really interesting. I'm not a doctor. I know the basics of biology. So when I got later into it and started asking questions, people were like, oh yeah, that's not possible. It's physically not possible. But at the time I was like, this is interesting. And, and quite honestly, all the tech companies in, in Silicon Valley and around the world that are coming up with interesting things have sometimes good stories to tell. And so we just started telling their story. And wow, it was like having a front row seat. Like I wasn't on stage as some people were, but I was the front row seat to this story unfolding. But at the time, it just was like, hey, this is pretty neat. And of course, people were poo-pooing it. And I didn't even think at the time. I mean, in retrospect, I'm like, you're right. The, the weaponization of story. I got pulled into something that I thought Hey, this seems good, but I had no I had no real way of vetting it. And and then the question is, right. you know, as a storyteller, is that our job? Are we supposed to vet everything and know the investors and know the boards of directors and know that the technology is sound? Enough? And it brings up a real a real kind of ethical conundrum, you know, because yeah, I would not want to tell that. Well, I would tell that story today but with a different lens, right? I mean, totally. <laughs> Hindsight 2020. And, and Alex Gibney did such a wonderful job of telling that story through that other lens. But it's really stark when I now kind of realize, oh, wow, we were all pulled into this with the best of intentions. And then yeah. in some ways, am I left feeling like we were propagandists, perhaps? And it's still really unsettling. I still have not kind of totally come to grips with it. But I think, you know, the opportunity, it's tough because as a storyteller, the opportunity to tell a good story and they wanted to do it stylistically, they didn't want it to be bland. It was fun, right? And that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that release of, yeah. of storytelling that isn't like pre-programmed. And they were like, no, let's just do something with this. And so and now I look back and say, oh God, man. <laughs> what, what were we doing? And then, yeah, to contrast that to somebody like Patagonia, who it's been vetted publicly. We, we understand. Yeah. I feel like if you, I mean, you, obviously you're not going to stick just with them because you have so many stories to tell and yeah. so many other interests, but like I, you're pretty safe with Yvonne Chinward. <laughs> yes. Unless his like, vo his voice suddenly he shows up in a black turtleneck <laughs> <laughs> the next time you meet with him. Or... I don't think so. I, he's you mostly want, flannel. Like, back away. <laughs> Funny story about Yvonne. He really is a minimalist. I mean, he, a minimalist is somebody who says, let's use the least, consume the least. And here's this guy that's advocating for a major brand that is based upon people buying things. But, you know, now they're saying if it's broken, bring it back, we'll fix it. He is such a minimalist that when we screened Artificial, he came to the screening with his wife, Melinda, who is also amazing, pulled up a chair and sat down and said, I'm ready to watch the film, which was a big moment in itself. We pushed play and realized as his, this was a rough cut, but as his interview came up, he was wearing in the interview the same shirt he was wearing in front of me. So I'm behind Yvonne watching him, watching himself wearing the same thing. I'm like, isn't this just so? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that, it's true. You don't need more than two or three. He's I mean. like, yeah, he's like, he's he, quite honestly, lately he's been, you know, really pushing on provisions because Patagonia Provisions is a food company. He said food yeah, eat every day. Awesome. He's like, most people don't buy a jacket, but once every 10 years. And I was like, I think you want to check on that, Yvonne, because more people buy than a jacket <laughs> once every 10 years. Than you Has he met my, he has not met my husband, clearly. <laughs> Yeah. How funny. Okay. So switching gears entirely, I think we gave you a little bit of a heads up, but we end every interview asking our guests what commercial from their childhood has stuck with them. Oh, because yes. To me, that was like the first time I was influenced. Gosh, that's right. I remember you did ask that and I forgot to give it thought. I remember thinking about it for, for once. Oh, probably funny enough. It probably is this is this is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? That, that was... That's especially funny for the two of us to be talking about because you made an anti-drug commercial in my house. <laughs> That's why I forgot that. That's right. With your daughter, who is spectacular. <laughs> That's right. She's very good at playing strung out. But I think that was, I think I remember it in part because we laugh about it so much. It was really effective. But, it was. But there was another commercial my little brother and I laugh about to this day where there's a dad who confiscates like a, a cigar box or a shoe box from his son under his son's bed. And then he opens it up and he said, what's this all about? And it's all these different drugs, like needles and marijuana and all these things. And he just stops and he looks up and says, I learned it from you, dad. And then it was this. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the funny thing is my brother and I laughed about because we're like, whoa, what was the dad into? Dad was into all that stuff. Wow. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think they're memorable in part because they were good. But in hindsight, they're so 
campy that you can't help but laugh at them, right? I mean, yeah. I know the other one that these are all kind of PSAs now that I think about it, but the other one was the Indian who was actually an Italian American. I just heard a whole story about oh, him. But... God, but I remember yeah. that. And he's standing on the pile of trash and he's got the tear dripping down. Turns out that was paid for by the plastics industry and big oil propagandists. And I it still was. remember the Indian who wasn't crying. <laughs> so yeah, yeah the, those are the ones I, I mean, there's, there's producty ones. I remember here and there like, Hey, Mikey likes it. But I think that was from like a waffle commercial or something like that. I'm trying to think C- of cereal, other, maybe, maybe. Oh no, you're right. It was a cereal, right? It was, it was Wheaties. Life, life, life. Cereals. life. They were like commercials were everything as a kid. Yeah. I remember Capri Sun. Great tasting fun. When you punch open one Capri Sun, <laughs> I'm like, that's still in my head. Like, I would like that space used for something else. Can I please not have that jingle stuck in there? I say that all the time when I'm listening to like 80s on 8 and know every single lyric. I just think like, imagine what I could accomplish <laughs> in my life. That's exactly, a friend of mine has said that. He's like, God, you know, if, if the, the lyrics to really bad Journey songs just weren't in your head, there would be so much space for other things. <laughs> But I think that's what we're supposed to do as storytellers. I mean, in the commercial world, it's jingle and it's short spots. But now we're getting to a place where brands are embracing this long form story that people are also remembering. I I continue almost six years later to have people talk about artificial and finding other works that I've done and how that still sticks with them. And I was like, wow. That's amazing that it's not a jingle and it's not a commercial spot, but the story is resonating. So it's still brand, in this case, advocacy, but it's being told in a way that you don't need a little short spot to remember. You remember the whole meaning of the film. To me, that's why, getting back to our earlier point, it seems like we've entered this kind of golden age. I mean, you can stream everything. When we release a film, we're releasing a film against every other film almost ever made because you can... You can access it all. If you want to watch the Criterion Collection and go back to some of the most greatest films of all time, you can do that tonight. You can binge, you could binge watch for a year and a half of just the best films yeah. ever made. And then there's all the terrible films that have been made. They're all available. So how do we how do we punch through that? And I think that's where this brand alignment actually can be a tool. It's a bit of a double-edged sword, but meaning Patagonia has created an audience that's willing to listen to stories. Can you imagine pitching this to Netflix? I'd like to tell a story about fish hatcheries. Would you be interested in buying that? They would be like, get the hell out of here, right? But because the audience that Patagonia had created, it allowed them access to a story they might not have found before. Because as an independent filmmaker, if I just released that story, how would I find an audience? It's an interesting thing now, because now we tell stories that in this case are tailored to that audience, but it's finding wider release as well because of the impact of brand. Well, I think it's all super exciting and me too. Tribeca needs to get with the program. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to submit this one. This Have year. them call me. <laughs> I will. We're hopefully this year with the scale of hope, they will, will consider that as well, because we're excited to share this message that Molly has about how we can all reframe reframe our our perspectives on what we need to do and how we can be a part of something that's really overwhelming and and seemingly insurmountable and through her experience we feel like wow we can do this and i think that's yeah. that's a metaphor for so many things in life that we should we should celebrate as a story love it amazing i can't wait i can't <laughs> wait well thank you so much this was awesome and again i'm glad i had the miraculous foresight <laughs> to invite you on <laughs> Well, thank you for having me. Perfect timing. Yeah. Awesome. Good to catch up. Bye. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Please check back next Monday for a new episode featuring marketing conversations through the lens of influence. I am your host, Danielle Wiley, and this is The Art of Sway. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Dan Farkas hosts a great podcast called The Strategic Communicator. Dan, tell us what these fine folks will hear when they listen. Jason, it's pretty simple. The Strategic Communicator podcast talks with industry leaders about emerging trends and how we can use various forms of communication to make the world a better place. Anyone listening will leave with tangible ideas you can use to help with your PR and marketing efforts. 
It's amazing. Where can people subscribe? Easy. You can go to passpr.com. You can find the show at marketingpodcast.net or just search the Strategic Communicator with Dan Farkas wherever you get your podcast. You heard him, folks. Go get it. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.